Hey everybody, what's up? Today we're gonna to be looking at a video called Why Woke People Are Making Everything Ugly. It's a video from the channel Think Before You Sleep. That's right, old friend of the show. Thanks, pal. Noah and I go way back. Way back to about two months ago when he reacted to a video of mine discussing literal communist Ash Sarkar from Novara Media talking about traditional relationships. A video where Ash spent 15 minutes calling you a bunch of bad buzzwords if you want to be traditional. It has lent a feminine veneer to conservative far-right and white nationalist ideologies. So Noah did a reaction to about half my video on Ash Sarkar. I was already busy with another project and I didn't want to burn a week or more on a reaction to his reaction to my reaction. So instead, I quickly responded to it in this big community post where I described my gripes about his arguments and his inability to do thorough research that he then responded to in another video. I'm not going to rehash all that. If you care, you can just look at the reference material in the description. Anyway, after all that, I thought it was done. Usually when stuff like this happens, creators take their shots at each other, one of them gets bored first, which ends the drama, and everyone forgets about the whole thing in about two weeks. However, that's not what happened this time. I made a couple videos about this channel, and I'm going to keep doing it, because it's I, I have a lot of fun. I can't allow that. If he's going to keep doing this, he can't be the only one having fun, so let's add another car to the reaction train, and allow me to respond to his response to my response to a Dove ad campaign about body positivity. But because I'm lazy, let's have Noah explain what the video he's reacting to was about. The video loosely centers around criticizing an ad campaign from the soap company Dove, which is Dove's real virtual beauty campaign, which focuses on inclusivity and representation for women in video games. The plan here is to go through his video and look at some of the arguments made in it. Arguments in support of his general thesis that this ad campaign is bad for various reasons, including the fact that it is part of a larger trend of wokeness in media and wokeness is bad for various reasons. What does wokeness mean in this case? Well, we're gonna find out, I'm sure. Communism. Woke means communism. Now the bread tubers love to say, that's not what that term means. It used to mean something else as some sort of gotcha on the anti-woke crowd, but words change meaning all the time and it was the communists who were using the term woke and thus that's what the word means now. Now that we have all that cleared up, basically my video was a response to that Dove campaign where a woke company tries to sell soap by using the same factually wrong Anita Sarkeesian line of thinking of, there's never been a woman in a video game before, suggesting that character customization doesn't exist in video games, and representation matters more than simply making a good product. Dove, as well as other companies, have been suggesting that characters that are purposefully made to be unattractive to promote representation should headline video games. I simply pointed out that the average consumer probably doesn't want that, and a couple of lefties got triggered. Even Hassan got in on it in his own way. Of course, Hassan is far too lazy to create his own reaction to my video, so he reacted to Noah's reaction to my reaction on Dove, and in between eating, he found time to say this. It's a soap commercial, dog. You're not using any soap ever for the rest of your life. Why do you care? Do I sit around and criticize tampon commercials? No. I have no use for them. You, very clearly, have no use for soap. Actually, Hassan, I don't need... Wait, he just left? Is he going to come back? Is this like a thing on Twitch? Can you just leave in the middle of someone else's video playing? Isn't that copyright infringement? Okay, he's back now. Let's try this again. Actually, Hassan, I don't need Dove Soap because I get my soap from Reed Street Soap Company. Thanks for the help with the smooth ad transition, buddy. Reed Street Soap is a company that strives to make the highest quality soap with the healthiest possible ingredients. I've been using this soap for a while now, and I love it. My favorite scent for the guys is the blue collar scrub, and for the girls, check out the bimbo bars. And speaking of art, look at this brand new lumberjack soap. It's like a little piece of Bob Ross in every bar. So check out Reed Street Soap Company by clicking on the first link in the description. Alright, getting back to Noah, after watching his reactions to me, I just get the feeling that he doesn't very often engage with material from people who don't agree with him. Because what happens a lot in his content is that he will say something that sounds intelligent, but when you actually start attacking the idea or investigate further, as you would if you were expecting someone to criticize your content, it either falls apart or sounds like complete nonsense. So to start things off, uh, this video is a little bit tough to break down because a lot of it is just think before you sleep, giving his opinions on stuff. Um, wow. He criticized me for giving my opinion on things. It's almost like I'm paid to do that. Is it really that tough to say you agree or disagree and break down why you think that? If I like Star Wars and you don't, you can't explain why? Are you sure you're cut out for YouTube? 
He also edits in this little bumper saying that giving my opinion is not an argument. Noah, an argument is anything that contains facts, reasoning, and logic. You can use those three things to argue why you have an opinion. And gee, Noah, as a commentator, I sure hope you were very careful to not give any of your opinions in this video. Otherwise, you're a hypocrite because opinions are bad and hard to break down. These opinions are often generally unrelated to actual critiques of the Dove ad campaign. Be careful, Noah. That sounds a lot like an opinion. You wouldn't want to suggest that it's wrong for me to give my opinions and then follow it up almost immediately with an opinion of your own, would you? So, for example, this clip. Oh, look, the ad comes with an article. We're bringing real beauty to the virtual world. Does the term beauty even mean anything anymore? Or is everybody just the same regardless of effort? He thinks that these women are not hot. So the definition of beauty is here being perverted by Dove. It's almost like what I said about self-care being important was commentary that was directly related to the Dove campaign. I'm literally commenting on a direct quote from the campaign's article. Did his opinion change during the argument? Because he never describes how my comments are unrelated. He just gives his opinion that I did bad content, doesn't explain why, and then moves on to say this. He later talks about how he went to an art museum with another anti-feminist YouTuber and that he didn't like the art. Or this clip. About a month ago, Dove came out with her latest body positivity campaign by partnering with Epic Games and using the Unreal Engine to create 3D models of realistic women. Wait, this was done with Unreal Engine? Really? Why do all these models look like crappy World of Warcraft avatars from 2006? So Dove is a bad, lazy company because their graphics are worse than a Zelda animation that a YouTuber made with a fraction of the budget. The key word there is worse because, again, that's subjective. That's not really true. Beauty is the sum total of people's opinions on a particular trait or group of traits being desirable. You can objectively measure what people agree on, and if most people agree on certain features being beautiful, then that's what's beautiful. There are studies that do this. Here's a meta-analysis on facial attractiveness if you want to know more about what a bunch of studies have found on the subject. Or, you can look at the fashion industry in its entirety where they have mathematically figured out how to maximize everyone's attractiveness based on body type. The particular tastes of a small handful of people who statistically deviate heavily are irrelevant because the standard of beauty is what people generally agree on. Major outliers are typically thrown out of research papers anyway, and nobody reasonable is going to say that this person here will get as many swipe rights on Tinder as Megan Fox because beauty is subjective. The Dove ad is being criticized because people in general don't find obesity attractive. He's acting as if the objective barometer for a quality animation is that you need 10 RTX 9090 to render it. But these Dove animations were not created with that purpose of supreme 8K quality in mind. Also, I will say that to me, these just look like Fortnite characters and Fortnite runs on Unreal Engine. I don't feel like they're that much different. Did he even look at the animation? I know Fortnite doesn't have the most detailed graphics, but these renders from Dove don't look nearly as good as the Fortnite characters that you showed, Noah. The idea of a good advertisement is that you are supposed to display that you pay attention to quality. This, however, looks like the 3D version of crappy Facebook Allegria art. That being said, there are very objective reasons why the vast majority of people would say that the Zelda art is better. Primarily, the amount of skill development and hard work that it took to make this smooth animation compared to this glitchy piece of crap where the character's arm does this during a baseball swing. Using language tricks to suggest that relatively equal amounts of people would find these two things similarly beautiful as a way of invalidating my point is dishonest. And to Noah's earlier point, no significant number of people who aren't political activists would say that this modern art picture is as good or better than the Mona Lisa. Why? Because anyone can scribble random shit onto a piece of paper. Look, I with no talent drew a similar quality picture, Put me in a museum. All of this is just rhetoric against quality, meritocracy, and exceptional feats of hard work. And as I suggested in my video on Dove, this kind of ideology is preaching laziness. So since the opinions can't be addressed, we're just going to move forward and look at the arguments. Are we watching the same video? Am I being gaslit? You just spent several minutes addressing my opinions and discussing why your opinions are better. This video doesn't make sense. Not addressing my opinions would consist of you not talking about them for four minutes. So first up, Think Before You Sleep makes the argument that Dove is a lazy company because they show a statistic on the screen that he doesn't believe is true. Okay, I don't believe that statistic at all. Where did you get that number? Did you simply ask three of your British friends? Because there is no way that most British women 
are eternally offended snowflakes who care about that kind of stuff. So this is the Opinium Women in Gaming survey from early 2021. It was a survey of about 1,400 United Kingdom gamers age 18 and over. And one of the key findings here was that 69% of women felt that there needs to be more female characters in video games in general. The two thirds statistic that Dove shows here, that is from this survey. And here you might say, well, Noah, Dove didn't cite where they found that statistic on the screen. So a viewer of the ad would have no idea where to search to confirm its validity. And well, first, Firstly, Think Before You Sleep is not just a viewer of the ad, he is a YouTube journalist, let's call him, with a big audience that's making a video that critiques this ad. All he had to do was a single Google search with some relevant terms to find this survey. It took me 10 seconds. It's really not that much work, but he didn't do it. Okay, so I'm supposed to do Dove's homework for them? Dove is the one who brought up the data. They're responsible for telling the audience where their stats came from. It's not my job to Google it for them. Noah, did you go to college? Because multiple times you suggested that I should take a class. Please, I beg of you, go take a media literacy course. God, my God. So if you've been to college, then you would know that Dove's lack of a source citation would result in a failing grade, if not additional punishment for plagiarism. It's not my responsibility to find your source for you. If someone gives statistical data and doesn't say where they got it from, then the proper thing to do is to take it with a grain of salt or assume that they are lying. But to no surprise, Noah is not the only one who believes that I need to go do Dove's homework for them. Okay, what the fuck is he saying? What he's saying is like, he goes, source, source. And instead of seeking out the source, he continues to just make claims that are just sourceless. Hassan, you graduated from Rutgers University. You should know that as the reader or as the viewer, it is not my job to find the sources that they use for their video. It's their job to cite their stuff properly. That, or they're liars because they said a statistic existed, but didn't give people any way to verify the validity of that statistic. If Rutgers didn't teach you that, Hassan, then you should sue them for your money back because they failed to educate you on research methodology, which is one of the primary things that you're supposed to learn in college. This, by the way, is coming from the people who will say, Source bro, where's your source, man? On literally every claim that you make after telling you that you should Google all their data for them. Particularly when one of the most common things women ask for in a relationship is leadership from men. Source! Can we get a source? Gee, I didn't know I needed a source for common knowledge. You know that's an exception in research, right? Next, he's going to ask for a source on what color the sky is. You don't think this is a common knowledge exception? Well then, who has to ask who out on the first date? Is it 50-50? Or is it almost exclusively the men initiating the relationship? That's leadership because leaders are the ones who go first. When women insist that men ask them out, decide where to go, and pay for the first dates, that is asking for leadership. Also, you don't need a PubMed article for everything you say. You are allowed to make claims based on your own experiences. There isn't a well-studied statistic for everything. Now, that's not to say that personal experience always reflects reality, but everyone makes claims and forms opinions based on personal experience. In fact, you did it in this video, Noah. Regardless, that's not what they're supposed to be about. They're about representation. So to someone who's interested in representation in games, the Dove animation would likely be better. Um, source bro, do you have a source for that claim? It's possible the majority could still disagree with you. Therefore, your opinion is invalid. See how dumb this game is? Not to mention that based on the standards that Hassan and Noah are holding me to with Dove, why can't they just Google my source for me? According to them, I shouldn't have to cite any of my claims because Googling any random thing I say is not that hard. That being said, let's take a look at this study that Noah found for us. Diversity in gaming, thought leadership. Let's look at the results. It starts by saying that women play games nearly as often as men, just two hours less than their male counterparts. Well, I don't like the framing of that at all. That's not nearly, that's a full 20% less. Nearly would be the difference of a few percent, not one fifth of the total amount. So we're off to a great start with this study trying to make it seem like women play games significantly more than they do. This study isn't heavily biased at all. Now let's take a look at the stats that Dove allegedly was referring to. I say allegedly because Dove didn't cite their sources or make any reference to it. So Noah really has no idea if he found the correct study. Second, there are two stats here, 74% and two out of three women. Nowhere does it say 74% for any data point. So this very well could be the wrong study. Do you see the problem with Dove not citing its sources? Dove might as well have just made the numbers up. But let's take a look at the number that Noah pointed out. It says that 69% of women say that there aren't enough female characters in games. Dove's ad was about body positivity, so by their statements, 
a reasonable person would infer that Dove was implying that two out of three women believe that there is not enough body positivity representation in video games. Not that there aren't enough female characters. Those two things aren't the same. More women does not equal more body positivity. If these are actually the stats that Dove used, then they are lying to you or wildly misrepresenting that study. On top of that, this report makes no mention of any of their methodology, so nobody can determine the validity of the measurement techniques that they use to get that data. For example, this study is missing all sorts of important demographic data. Did they survey people randomly? Or did they survey a bunch of college kids? Colleges tend to lean very left, so you aren't going to get a very accurate representation of how the general population feels if you're only surveying people on the left, which is why you get nonsense like almost 70% of women saying that there aren't enough women in video games when pretty much half the cast of every game these days is female, and it's been that way for a long time. So anyway, after nearly completing this entire video and reviewing the information a bunch of times during editing, I decided that there is no way in hell that Noah got the correct study, so I did what I shouldn't have had to do and checked all of Dove's partnerships from the original article, which led me to this article here from Women in Games. Guess what? It turns out that Opinium did not do the survey. As far as I can see, it appears that Dove themselves did the survey, and Women in Games and the Center for Appearance Research endorsed it. Pay attention to the wording, by the way. It's women in games, not women in gaming, which was a search term that Noah used and probably why he got the wrong data. But I have looked everywhere and cannot find this study. Originally, I thought the Center for Appearance Research did the study, but I used every related search term I could think of and looked at every publication they made over the past five years and still couldn't find it. After that, I noticed that the Center for Appearance Research merely endorsed the study. At this point, I've looked everywhere I could possibly look and cannot find this research. It looks like what happened is, is that Dove did a survey, never published it, and got two very politically biased organizations to approve of it, so nobody would question the origin of the data. That seems very dishonest. Do you know it would have been honest? How about you link the study at the bottom of the real virtual beauty article, like you're supposed to do if you're acting in good faith? But despite not being able to find the actual research from Dove, I do find this whole thing funny because Noah was so sure that he got the right study, and he was so arrogant about it too. The two-thirds statistic that Dove shows here, that is from this survey. All he had to do was a single Google search with some relevant terms to find this survey. It took me 10 seconds. It's really not that much work, but he didn't do it. Maybe you should have spent more than 10 seconds Googling. Moving on to my next point, Noah doesn't like my conspiracy theory about ice cream. This one's just great. More investigative journalism. Uncovering a conspiracy that Dove actually did this campaign to make you buy ice cream. So where in this ad is there some push to get you to buy junk food? Where could that be drawn from? Is there a candy bar? Is there a big sign saying buy Nabisco products? Is Cynthia sitting down to crack open a nice cold jar of mayonnaise. Uh, no, she's not, and none of those things happen. Yeah, of course they aren't going to directly admit that they're promoting fat acceptance to sell junk food. That would make their plan not work, and it would cause a ton of backlash. This is called under-the-surface thinking, Noah. Are people only allowed to think superficially? What I find strange, though, is that he is fully capable of under-the-surface thinking, when it comes to calling Tucker Carlson a white nationalist. Do you think so, like, we can just, Tucker Carlson we should just is a move white on. nationalist, by chance? Dude, like... This is the type of stuff, like... Why does nobody answer my questions? There, It's yes, no. I, I mean, yeah, of course. So what's... what? I've watched his content. You know he never self-refers as one? All right, so... Look, dude. By what process could you infer that he is a white nationalist without him actually saying that he is one? I mean, like, the rhetoric he uses, right? Well, Tucker Carlson didn't come out and identify as a white nationalist, so you can't say he is. Jeez, Noah, this is so bad. Please stop scripting your videos in one hour. My most vocal criticism of Debate Bros came in the follow-up video to my left tube guide with a section on Debate Bros. Not gonna lie, I wrote that script in about an hour, so not my cleanest work. Wow, I have never written a script in only an hour, even when I was new. Now, obviously, I don't think he only spends an hour to script every video, but he definitely doesn't spend that much time on his scripts as I've watched him make a full video in two days. You can tell he's not putting much effort into things like proofreading or fact-checking because his research is terrible and because in every video he's made on me, he has weird takes that should have been weeded out as weak or bad arguments, like it's wrong to say your opinion as a content creator, or he creates standards that are impossible to uphold, like you can't make inferences based on a person or a company's behavior. 
Even though he does it himself, Tucker Carlson wasn't the only example. Noah is very much one of those people who will call a person slightly right of Marx a member of the alt-right. Moving on to the pinned comment because Noah further elaborates on his statements in this section. His comment says, TBYS's assertion that body positivity should exclude fat people and be reserved for those with circumstances out of their control ignores that fatness is, for many people, out of their control. Fatness is most often closely tied to countless factors outside of personal choice, namely genetics, and also the industrial and governmental factors that have pushed people towards the consumption of processed foods for about 70 years. Huh, industrial factors that have pushed people towards the consumption of processed foods. Is that not what I said when I pointed out how many ice cream brands that Unilever owns? Dove is promoting an ideology that convinces people away from changing their behavior, which will ensure that they continue eating more Ben and Jerry's. Oh look, Noah referenced a Jeff Nippard video that quotes a study. Noah references this material to say that Jeff Nippard provides proof that obesity is genetic. Does his video actually do that? Maybe? There is one study he showed from 1990 discussing 12 pairs of identical twins being fed a surplus of 1,000 calories a day for roughly three months with 24-hour monitoring. However, I have so many questions for the study that I didn't see them account for. For example, the amount of water the subjects drank. How much fiber did they eat? How many hours per night did these people sleep? Yes, that affects weight gain. Make sure you get 7 to 8 hours per night. Also, what was the intensity level of the exercise during their allotted 30-minute walks? Walking faster will burn more calories. Last, if people were able to sneak cigarettes during the study, how do they know they couldn't just buy food from a vending machine when no one was looking? All of those things might explain the differences their subjects had in weight gain. Not that the researchers didn't do a good job. It really seems like they tried to factor in everything. But a study like this is super difficult to pull off with high accuracy because there are so many ways to cheat it. They would need to do this study multiple times to account for all the ways participants might break it. More importantly, during his video, Jeff Nippard completely contradicts Noah and says that despite any disadvantages that you may have, you can still make choices that cause weight loss. All of this doesn't mean that calories in, calories out only works for some people. It is a simple fact that obesity results from eating more calories than you burn. And tightly controlled metabolic word experiments repeatedly confirm that caloric intake is the driver of both fat loss and fat gain. So this means that anyone who is obese got obese by eating in a sustained caloric surplus over time. Clearly, if people wanna lose weight, even if there are many factors working against them, such as low metabolic rate, high hunger, and so forth, it's still possible to lose weight if you sustain a caloric deficit over time. However, Jeff also said that people being obese was not a choice as his final conclusion, which is confusing because during the video, he said multiple times that you could make choices that cause weight loss, regardless of genetics, but it may be more difficult for some people for reasons that he listed in the video. But that's certainly a far stretch from what Noah was suggesting in his pinned comment or what the fat acceptance crowd usually states, which is that weight is completely unrelated to their personal choices. I have made plenty of videos showing that, and I certainly have never seen a real-life example of this stock footage that Jeff used in his video of a thin person eating junk food and an obese person not being able to lose weight despite eating oranges. I have never seen that play out in real life, and real obese people are always significantly overeating and eating junk food. Also, don't be fooled by the nuance here where Noah says, sure, personal choice is important for health, because in section two, he defines health as different from fatness when he says that Cynthia, an obese woman with an eating disorder, can be healthy. I think a lot of times it sounds like Noah is giving a nuanced take when he actually isn't. So in conclusion, Noah, a single study from over 30 years ago with a ton of confounding factors is not strong evidence that obese people are genetically doomed into being fat. Anyway, Noah loves research, so let's get into more research that he definitely did not read the full context of. So is this the case? Does fat representation make people fatter? Does limiting this representation contribute to any sort of health benefits? And, well, uh, no. No, it doesn't. There's no evidence for that whatsoever. Not to think before you sleep videos require any evidence, he's just talking. But the research actually shows that the opposite is true. Quoting from a meta-analysis here on the relationship between body image and body weight control, misperception and dissatisfaction with body weight are risk factors for participating in an unhealthy lifestyle and make it harder to follow a healthier lifestyle. Body image disturbance also made it more likely to underreport calorie intake. Okay, let's take a look. You're saying roughly that fat acceptance campaigns don't cause obesity. I read the whole study, and as far as I can see, it makes no claim that would allow you to call it evidence for your point. 
All this sentence that he highlighted here is saying is that obese people have unhealthy habits and are unhappy about the way they look. I know you can quickly look at these words and interpret them as low self-esteem from body shaming or whatever leads to an unhealthy lifestyle, but that's not what the study says, and he would know that if he actually read it. In fact, if you read more than the abstract, it gives the sentiment of what I was saying. Allow me to quote it. In general, body weight satisfaction was associated with less intention to change weight or lifestyles. On the contrary, body weight dissatisfaction was associated with higher BMI and greater intention to change lifestyle or weight and dietary restraint in women. Another important motivation for weight management were concerns for either future or present health. Wow, Noah, look what happens when you read more than the abstract. People who are dissatisfied with their situation are the ones who want to change their weights, not the ones who think they are fine the way they are. The only nuance I would add is that this study suggests that a few of the dissatisfied people need proper weight loss counseling. But this is the Ludwig video all over again. Noah, this right here is exactly why I refused to respond to your initial videos and instead told you to watch the video I did on Ludwig, Hassan, and Vosh. There sure are a lot of parallels here, as Ludwig also failed to read an entire study that ended up saying what I said in my initial video. To further enhance my point, here is reference 29 that the study Noah quoted used to come to their conclusion about weight satisfaction. Here it says, 93% of men and 95% of women who reported being dissatisfied with their weight also reported an intention to change their diet or physical condition. So this study said that almost everybody who wasn't satisfied with their weight wanted to change. Based on the data that you quoted, Noah, if you're trying to get people to lose weight, why would you encourage them to be satisfied with obesity? Why would you promote fat acceptance, which creates magazines like this, saying that being obese is healthy? It's not healthy. Now, I'm not going to go on a full diatribe about why obesity is unhealthy. Most people already know why it's unhealthy, and I've already made a ton of videos about it, but you can just look at the CDC stats. Also, the first sentence, guys, the very first sentence, I mean, literally he read none of this study because the first sentence of that study that Noah linked says that obesity is unhealthy and included a reference, reference number one, that said health at every size education didn't really do anything to improve physical health except for maybe a little reduction in LDL cholesterol to which these days is very debatable if that metric even matters. You can listen to this doctor here for more information on that. It gets better. On top of this, the second sentence of the study quotes this meta-analysis here from 2017 that goes over multiple studies showing that pretty significant numbers of overweight and obese people underestimate how big they are and often say they are about the right weight, which is a problem based on resource 29 from the original study that says that people who were dissatisfied with their body image were far more likely to want to get healthy, not the ones who were fine the way they were. The study on underestimation of weight status theorizes that normalization of being overweight and obese is a significant contributing factor to why these people underestimate their situation. And gee, I wonder what movement out there is causing obese people to be delusional about their weight status. Honestly though, Noah has fumbled so many times in his research that I'm starting to think that maybe I should hire Noah to Google my research for me. He's very good at scoring in his own goal. Now going back to the meta-analysis on health at every size, by the way, meta-analysis is a research term for we reviewed a bunch of studies on a particular topic. But the interesting thing about it is that they primarily focused on studies with a control group. A control group is the placebo group, which means they didn't get the health at every size intervention. The experimental group is the one that gets the new intervention that's being researched. This methodology is used so they can test if the thing being researched is actually more effective than simply doing nothing or simply doing what people would typically do. In these cases, the placebo group got standard dietary advice, and guess what? The results for the health at every size education and the standard dietary advice were pretty much the same. Now, fat acceptance groups always like to mention that health at every size education is good for people's self-esteem or other psychological metrics that don't prevent diabetes. However, standard dietary advice was also good at improving people's self-esteem. This situation is really funny because the whole study that Noah quoted completely contradicts his narrative right from the beginning. He obviously didn't read any of it. This is why you don't just read the abstracts, Noah. The abstracts are just a summary of the findings of the study as a way of filtering which studies are relevant to your research and which ones aren't. In order to determine if the study is actually valid, you need to figure out how they came to that answer by reading their methodology. Just like math class, researchers need to show their work or their answers and data don't count. That's why I poked fun at Dove for not citing their resources. 
Next, Noah throws up two more studies here on this topic. Negative body image is also closely linked to multiple different health problems, including things like depression and stress. Depression and stress are linked to weight gain and obesity. Ergo, having a negative body image does not help you lose weight. Oftentimes, it's the opposite. It helps you gain weight, and it keeps you generally unhealthy. So I'm going to ignore these because the prior study he quoted said that dissatisfaction of body image motivates people to change, and these new studies don't prove his point of negative body image causing weight gain. They just say that people who are overweight are stressed and depressed. The most reasonable interpretation here is that people aren't gaining weight because they have a negative body image. They have a negative body image because they are overweight or obese. I mean, the first one was just a questionnaire, so right off the bat, correlation does not equal causation. Congratulations, you found out that overweight people don't like being overweight, or you simply found out that an overweight person can also be depressed. Also, this one here, he straight up ripped from the Jeff Nippard video, so there's no way he read that whole study and checked it for validity. Jeff even states that the risk factor for weight gain is small, and looking at the information here on screen, it says that most of the studies found no relationship between stress and weight gain. But honestly, I don't think that Jeff read the study either, considering that his commentary comes right from the abstract. I'm actually a little disappointed. That being said, let's finish off with one more study that Noah didn't read. On top of this, in the same way that negative body image is bad for your health, positive body image is actually good for it. There's a study here, positive body image is positively associated with emotional and psychological and social well-being in British adults. Body appreciation significantly predicted all dimensions of well-being. Think Before You Sleep hates it when people are fat. He wants them to stop being fat. So he should actually love this Dove ad campaign. The campaign is promoting positive self-image, and positive self-image promotes health in a myriad of ways, which does include people maintaining healthier habits when it comes to eating. That's what he wants, right? All right, so right away, this study he shows here has nothing to do with positive body image leading to weight reduction or better physical health. Diabetes, joint issues, and heart disease don't care about how good you feel about yourself. So I did what I absolutely guarantee you that Noah didn't do, which was pay $50 for the study. By the way, these studies aren't all free, and not only did I have to spend hours fact-checking Noah, but I also had to pay money to do it. Here are some of the questions that they use to determine well-being in the study. And nowhere in this study does it claim that higher body image scores led to healthier eating like Noah claimed. Now, Noah might be basing that claim on the earlier study that said that higher body satisfaction was associated with healthier eating habits, but that's only because the people who had healthier eating habits were already thin. I mean, holy crap, for how much this guy said, source bro? or you provided no evidence in his reactions to my videos, he has no idea how to read research. I don't know if you went to school, but just like Hassan, if you paid for college, Noah, you should sue them for your money back because they failed you. Stop quoting PubMed articles because anyone who knows how to read research can see that you have no idea what you're doing. You're better off just giving your opinion on things. And despite that you're into lifting, which is good, exercise is a good thing, I will compliment him for that, but despite that, you clearly don't have expertise or training in health sciences, so you really should be keeping your mouth shut on the topic. You're outside of your scope of knowledge here, which means that even if you did know how to read research properly, you would not be qualified to accurately interpret studies on health. Reading research requires background knowledge on the subject, or you will be incapable of criticizing it competently, or you'll improperly utilize the information. Personally, I would be embarrassed if I suggested to my audience that I'm a good researcher, and I got caught only reading the abstract of multiple studies with a field that I have very little background knowledge in. I would also feel guilty for doing lazy research that could very well lead my audience into believing wrong ideas because I wanted to get a video out in two days. No wonder this guy has bad takes like this drawing here is just as good as this drawing. This modern art drawing is the visual representation of Noah's skill at research. And by that, I mean that anyone with no talent or skill development can read the summary of an article on PubMed and say they did research. All right, let's move away from all the studies and get to Noah's final act. The final point I want to talk about today concerns the idea of sexualization. Think Before You Sleep doesn't like it when characters in games are wrongfully labeled as sexualized. But she said two female characters from a game that they never identified were over sexualized. Whatever that means, because they'll call Laura Croft hypersexualized for just standing there and doing nothing sexual. So he doesn't think that Lara here is being sexual. Okay, so first off, does he think that a character needs to be butt naked and doing the splits in order to be sexualized? There are other factors that go into this definition beyond what a character is doing. In the case here, Laura is wearing short shorts and a tight crop top, revealing her legs and midriff. 
Midriff. Midriff. Pancake flat midriff. Laura is a character who shoots people and runs through the woods and shit. This outfit is clearly impractical for that purpose, but she's wearing it because she is being sexualized. He doesn't fully clarify why he claims this outfit is impractical, but it sounds like he's saying it's impractical for physical activity. That's not true. How are short shorts and a crop top impeding her mobility? On that note, speaking of realism, a big reason why obese people aren't in these kinds of games is because they can't actually do the physical activity that the characters are doing. No one who is 400 pounds is doing the kind of marathon running that video game characters do to get from place to place, nor can obese people jump around like an acrobat to slay demons. Outside of Olympic lifting, there's a reason why you don't really see obese people in the Olympics. As for the part about sexualization, is she wearing that outfit because she's being sexualized, or is she wearing that because the outfit is fashionable for her body type? Allow me to clarify this because Noah's line of thinking is something that many people use to attack women for how they were born. Two different women can wear the same outfit and whether you're a slut or not is determined by your body type, not by the clothes you're wearing. These are similar tops except one girl has curves and one doesn't. Can you tell me which girl is going to get called a slut? I mean, this girl literally wears lingerie tops that basically have the same coverage as this outfit here. And as far as I can see, Everyone is calling her an innocent angel purely because her body proportions are petite and not curvy. Let's continue. The main thing with this example, though, is that Laura's body has proportions that are unrealistic in comparison with the vast majority of people. These proportions are considered sexually attractive and are thus created by the developers with the intent of appealing to the male gamer gaze. Those are the arguments in favor of the idea that this character is being sexualized. Wait, did he censor thin Laura but kept fat Laura fully in view? Do you not understand that you're body shaming curvy women? This is a body type that real women have. Noah, even you're doing it. I initially thought this was a mistake and he just forgot to censor it because everything else was censored, but this specific image was referred to multiple times and only thin Lara was censored. Unless he doesn't watch his videos from mistakes before uploading, this was done on purpose. Do you not see why I say that body positivity in the cultural zeitgeist is solely about obesity? Noah spent the whole video saying it was wrong for me to criticize obesity because it's air quote, body shaming obese people and that will make those people depressed, but then he straight up body shames thin curvy women. Okay, but surely Noah has some good shots at me, right? Okay, so now let's roll the next clip uh, of this guy, what this guy's saying. But I get it. Video games sexualize women way too much. Let's see how Dove intends to remedy this problem. Well, that's one way to start. We have a woman here who was fully covered up, who then changed into something that was more revealing. She basically is in the same outfit that Laura Croft was in. So he takes Dove to task here for sexualizing this character, Cynthia, because she's showing more skin, immediately after crying about how this isn't sexualized. Do you notice anything here about anything related to skin? Um, she's showing it, a, a bunch of it. That doesn't make any sense. It does, though, when you realize that his definition is entirely dependent on whether or not it helps his argument. Well, that's a projection. Hey, guy who's trying to straw man me, I was using their definition of sexualization because they complain that Lara is sexualized, yet Dove put their character in effectively the same clothes. I wasn't being morally inconsistent. If Lara's t-shirt and shorts is what sexualizes her, then it's the same for Cynthia. Okay, the last part with this is real weird, so go ahead and strap in. It concerns the framing of one of the shots from the animation, and Think Before You Sleep has certain feelings about this shot. So now we have a bent over ass shot that is center of the frame that adds nothing to the story. They went full on anime camera angles and somehow they're going to claim that it's not an attempt at sexualizing the character. Buddy, buddy, you're real worked up. You got to relax. When Think Before You Sleep sees this shot here, to him, it's the same as this shot here. When he looks at this shot, all he sees is this. He's so worked up about seeing a woman from behind that his brain fails to render the rest of the frame. Actually, I didn't even notice this when I first watched the ad. I only noticed it because I was watching a woman review it and she pointed out that Cynthia's outfit was sexualized. So here she is uh, in less clothes, wearing less clothing, mind you, more revealing outfit. See, that's another part that really says to me that they don't care about sexualization. This isn't a modesty thing. She's wearing basically the exact same outfit that Lara Croft is criticized for wearing. It's definitely inspired by Lara Croft's outfit. So Lara Croft can't wear this without being called a slut, but she can wear it and it's, you know, female empowerment. 
me watching this clip then led to me noticing where they needlessly put the camera, and that led to my extended commentary on what Melanie Mack said. But that's not the only time that Noah tries to frame me as some sort of weirdo as a way of strawmanning me. Here he is doing it again with Chun-Li. One last example that I thought was kind of funny was him saying that because the reason he plays games is to escape reality, characters in games shouldn't be ugly because he doesn't want to insert himself into an ugly character. Not to mention that video games are primarily about escapism, and if I'm playing a character, I want to play someone who is more attractive than me so I can self-insert and escape from my less glamorous life. So he doesn't want to fantasize about being ugly, he wants to instead fantasize about being the juicy thighs muscle mommy Chun Li. So, uh, hey, why don't you show the rest of that frame while you're making that point, because the reason I showed this image of Chun Li was to show that women were unhappy and did not want to play overweight characters. I mean, for how many times he accused me of strawmanning or vilifying in his prior reactions, it's insane that he has the audacity to say this. And two, that he doesn't actually care about fat people. Yes, the guy who tells you the uncomfortable truth is the one who doesn't care about you, and Lucifer from Paradise Lost who lies to you to make you feel good, is the hero. If you actually watch my content, then you'll know I care a lot about helping these people, which is why I don't gaslight them by telling them that they are healthy at 350 pounds, like Cosmo does. Moving on. When Think Before You Sleep sees this shot here, to him, it's the same as this shot here. Now, do we notice anything different about these two shots? Well, the anime shot is just one thing. It's someone's butt, it's a low angle of a skirt, and it's, a, you know, very sexualized. That's all that's in the frame. But the shot of Cynthia has other information in it. Namely, it shows her standing between two posters of herself in the armor. Now, this is up for interpretation, of course, but my reading of it is that she's constrained and sandwiched in the frame between these posters, just like the armor constrains and sandwiches her body. And so when she leaves, she's breaking away from it or something. Got it. Somebody go tell the video game companies that all they have to do to not be accused of sexualizing a female character is to simply put other material into the frame. Wow. Just wow. That is really someone who is doing everything he can to be right. So basically then, Cynthia could be naked and it wouldn't be sexualization based on what he said, because the point of the shot was to add emphasis to the photos that are off to the sides. Jeez, are you really going to tell me that this outfit on Lara Croft is an impractical sexualization of the character for the male gaze, but Cynthia here, who is effectively in the same outfit, is not a sexualization of the character? The main thing with this example, though, is that Laura's body has proportions that are unrealistic in comparison with the vast majority of people. These proportions are considered sexual attractive and are thus created by the developers with the intent of appealing to the male gamer gaze. Oh, I see. So you're saying that it's only sexualization if the character is attractive. Weird take. I'm pretty sure if I was obese, I would be offended by that and it would not give me very good self-esteem. Please, I beg of you, go take a media literacy course. God, my God. First of all, with how bad your research skills are and how smug you were about those research skills, you have no business recommending that anyone take a class. Second, if an average viewer has to take a media literacy class to understand how this image is less sexual than this image, then Dove did something wrong because this ad campaign is for average people, not for media literacy experts. But just to clear things up and make sure that we still have all the important visual information in the shot, I fixed the image for you. I swear, if this ad contained Lara Croft with her ass out, he would be complaining about it being hypersexualized, much like he will cape for Dove or Ash Sarkar when they don't properly cite their resources, but will say, source bro, any chance he can get with me. If you want an example of heavy bias, that's heavy bias. There's so much evidence that Noah doesn't see stuff like this because he lives in an echo chamber and doesn't actually listen to the opinions of people on the opposing team with an open mind. For example, in his pinned comment, he references this video here where he talks about an anti-woke comedian making some jokes that he thought were bad. Side note for positivity, I will compliment Noah's second time by saying that his comedic timing is good. It's hard to see that with his video all cut up, but it was refreshing, because usually the people I cover have the creative talent of Lily Singh. But I digress. Noah did a fat acceptance video reacting to Isaac Butterfield, and towards the end of his reaction, 
he offers his audience a nuanced approach to the subject. It's not like there aren't legitimate criticisms to be made about any of these movements, like fat positivity and body acceptance. People have and continue to make valid criticisms from both outside and within. So take this video, for example, from the YouTuber Kayla Claus, who criticizes members of the fat acceptance community for saying that calling yourself midsize is fat phobic. Kayla makes the point that doing this erases an entire category that people might actually prefer to identify with, and that this preference doesn't necessarily have to be rooted in fat phobia. One really clear and thorough examination of this topic is a video from Mr. Beard called Both Sides of the Fat Phobia Debate Need to Stop, which gives a really nuanced look at the ongoing debate in this space and how a lot of times it's much more nuanced than the most amplified voices make it seem. While he does clearly draw a line that he stands against all fat phobia and that fat phobia is far more common and harmful than the occasional overzealous fat activism, he does have criticisms for fat activists. The most prominent example being criticism of the claim that the act of losing weight is inherently fat phobic. This is another example of aspects of these movements that might actually be causing harm to people that they're supposed to be liberating by shaming them for their personal decisions about their own bodies. Allow me to add nuance on this subject from a bunch of people who are on my own ideological team. Now personally, I do agree with the nuanced opinion that he showed about weight loss, but do you mean to tell me that you watch opposing viewpoints so little that you couldn't find a single good take from an opponent? You had to find it from a friend? And it's not just me bringing attention to Noah's echo chamber behavior. Several months ago, he had some drama with patient Xena on the topic of representation in reference to the Little Mermaid movie. Honestly, after watching her original video, I could not fathom how Noah could disagree with this because patient Xena had the most middle-of-the-road take on the Little Mermaid that I watched. She believes that black people should have more representation so that they can have more characters of their own race to look up to. Personally, I don't think the race of the hero matters. A good hero is a good hero, but her take is certainly something that the left can agree with. However, on the other side of that, she said that black people should get their own stories instead of race-swapped hand-me-down characters, which is something the right can agree with. Well, Noah got triggered over this take, Patient Xena responded, and towards the end of her video, she shed a little light on why he would have an issue with her very middle-of-the-road opinion. And now we get into the nooks and crannies of the real issue that Noah has with my video. He doesn't give a crap about how black people feel about black representation. His issue with me and my channel is that some of my views do align with conservative views. And because I am very moderate in my views and very moderate in a lot of my stances, my channel has attracted a combination audience. Some of my viewers are conservative, some of my viewers are left-wing. I think his biggest concern is that the left-wing part of my audience are going to suddenly be exposed to the most dangerous thing of all, which is a different perspective. God forbid people on the left explore some of the viewpoints that exist on the right, because that is scary. Because as much as Noah ironically challenges me on my points about echo chambers, I actually genuinely don't believe in echo chambers. Noah quite clearly does believe in echo chambers because he's essentially at this point fear mongering to his audience about the dangers of them potentially being taken on the path of discovering alternative perspectives and alternative views. I think that's a fair interpretation because Noah Noah starts his video with, oh my god, look how big her audience is. He can gaslight and say that he was only doing this as a way of justifying his reaction to her as not punching down, because Patience Zena recently had a much smaller channel, but Noah does the whole, look how many followers this person has, they have so much influence bit, a number of times, and he's done it to me multiple times by posting my subscriber count in the thumbnail of every video he's made on me, mixed in with a, oh my god, think before you sleep has so many followers guys, right? during his reactions. Think Before You Sleep is not just a viewer of the ad, he is a YouTube journalist, let's call him, with a big audience that's making a video that critiques this ad. And breadtubers in general love to mention how much influence their opponents have as some sort of weird gotcha. And the point of them saying that is so that they can then say this. My fear here is that videos like this open up the possibility not just ideologically, but algorithmically, that people may be swayed into far-right thinking by starting with this seemingly innocuous interpretation of an anti-black controversy. Upon hearing this take from a creator who is co-opting the aesthetics of nuance without actually functionally providing that nuance, viewers may be pushed into anti-woke and eventually far-right echo chambers without realizing it until it's too late. If your content leans anti-woke, it's only a matter of time before YouTube plugs you in with some of the channels that we looked at today. It's funny how they'll say that they aren't in an echo chamber when they are constantly trying to convince people that watching your first Jordan Peterson video means you're only about a week away from joining the alt-right. Statements like that are called fear-mongering. That's someone who doesn't want you to look at opposing viewpoints. 
Woke lefties throw out all kinds of buzzwords to try to convince their audience away from listening to dissenting opinions, and they'll say those buzzwords about anyone who is slightly right of Karl Marx. I mean, Patience Zena pointed out that Noah called Abba and Preach far right. It was in that last clip, you can go back and watch it. But Abba and Preach? Have you watched their content? They aren't on the right. Is systemic racism really gone? That's the question I pose to you. Well, of course not. I doubt Noah is even aware of the anti-woke left that started with people like Chris Reagan. So which side do you think is more afraid of opposing views? Anyone who actually listens to opposing viewpoints with an open mind can tell that Noah doesn't do that because he makes so many one-sided mistakes like not thinking that his opponent would actually read the full studies he's referencing. Because if he thought that, he would never have used the studies that he put on screen. Also, if he actually read the studies that were behind a paywall, then he would have put some of the full article on screen as proof that he read more than the abstract. Or maybe he's too used to reacting to people who are equally bad at research. So everyone watching, please, please, please do not live in an echo chamber or you will do really dumb stuff like this. If you're on the right, I want you to go down that radical leftist pipeline by starting with a Destiny video, and then you can hit something more left like Vosh, and finish up with the extreme left by reading a Robin D'Angelo book. If you're on the left, watch a Jordan Peterson video and keep going down that alt-right pipeline until you get to laugh at some of the asinine stuff that Nick Fuentes says. Doing that will make you stronger. You'll see how ridiculous the opinions are on the extremes, and when you get back to some of the more reasonable content towards the middle, you'll find opponents who won't let you get away with stupid ideas. Last, when you're watching this stuff, you cannot watch it as if you're only watching it to crap on every point the person makes. You need to watch this stuff and interpret their ideas as if you were the person trying to explain them. Because if you're just sitting there taking the worst interpretations of everything they say, then you aren't helping yourself. You'll learn nothing by doing that because your closed-mindedness will prevent their ideas from causing you to critically think about your own ideas, which is the whole point of engaging with opposition. We all have ideas that are wrong, and the only way to find the right ones is to listen to people who will challenge what we believe. Anyway, thanks for watching. Follow me on Twitter, or X, or whatever the hell it's called now, and I'll see you in the next video.